You keep your eyes open <coughs> and watch people talking to one another on the tube or in buses. You can see these hand movements which are accompanying speech. We can't help them. There's a very large and interesting literature about the hand movements that accompany speech. <coughs> And they are almost always like that, like that, and the thing is occasionally just you'll be over your shoulder. <laughs> and there's an hour, very large and interesting literature on the hand movements that accompany speech. Um, of course, in Italy it is different. Well, of course it's different, <laughs> but, 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 but so is Italian. <laughs> um, I mean, all the languages are different, and the languages which, with the, or the gestures which accompany speech, are, although they are very different, not that much different, there are certain things that Italians do, certain things the French people do with their hands, which are characteristic there as it were manual uh, idioms of that particular culture. But m on the whole, if you watch people in, uh, in Italian talking, um, you would find it hard, with certain exceptions, to identify them as being particularly Italian movements. They actually go with, and th this man called David McNeil is a professor of uh, psychology at Chicago, wrote a wonderful book, and a nice second volume, it's called Hand and Mind, and it's about the hand movements that accompany speech. And uh, he's one of the first people to classify them. For example, that they are, in fact, very often what he calls batons. They beat time to the prosody. You say, I simply won't do that. And he goes up and down in time to what they are saying. Mm. And they're, ca they're called batons because they like what a conductor is doing when he's beating time to what he's conducting. And then there are what he calls iconic movements, which um, are, they, they don't, you can do without them. And I'll tell you a very interesting thing, but they often um, um, uh, refer to what you're talking about. You'll say, um, that night we all came together, and uh, when, the train came, uh, when the plane came in to land, and they'll do that and that. <laughs> now, the fact is that it's obviously not essential to communication, because the interesting thing is that if you watch on trains and uh, buses, you'll see people talking to someone who can't see their movements, and they're going, yes, well, I don't think I'm going to do that. Mm, yeah, right. Well, okay. And then they're doing that when they can't be seen. But then, so it's making no contribution, but they can't help it. Yes. Because, in fact, we have these movements which accompany speech, as opposed to the movements which are substitutes for speech, which we have with the people who are deaf. And sign language is completely different from the language which accompanies speech. And there are some uh, things like heart. Well, well just occasionally, yeah. but, but on the whole, if you will look at them carefully, there's a great, a huge literature on this as well, on American Sign Language, English Sign Language, and they're all very, very different, except for certain things where they are, they tend to be iconic. Mm. And what, there are things which are, which he also calls deictic movements, which occur as accompaniments of speech, you say, um, Yes, well, we all went down the street, and they will point back like that. E even though the street they're talking about is no longer there, they're talking about, we went down the street, and then about two hours later, we all came back again, and the <laughs> thumb goes over the shoulder. <laughs> and it's also used for expressing re the relationship of the speaker to time as well. They'll say, um, yes, well, I hope we'll do that next year. And they'll use the index finger for next year. And then they'll say, but oh, <laughs> you see what happened last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that alternation, which you don't have to learn, um, well, you do have to learn in the sense that children become acquainted with it at a very early stage when they copy their parents' hand movements. There are interesting um, differences in countries, because I remember a friend of mine describing to an African friend yes. how tall his child was. Yes. And he went like that, and they all fell into great grief because that's a sign the child is dead. Ah, yes. Things well, like that. There may be idioms, there may be manual idioms which are in fact peculiar to the particular culture. But on the whole, while people are talking, if they're not making specific references to what they're talking about or who they're talking about, they will tend to be moving their hands in much the same way that we do all the time. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue. Um, that Jonathan, can I move you to this whole question of updating or not updating, oh, yeah. taking great works? And you re revisited, as you've said yourself, Leah, for four or five times. Yes. Um, what's your sort of theory, philosophy, or whatever about Well, I have a very straightforward approach to it, um, unlike my uh, younger colleagues who, I mean, I have updated one or two things, um, often with considerable success. Rigoletto. Rigoletto, which I, when Lord Harwood asked me to do Rigoletto, and I said, well, I can't bear the idea of doing it in the antique world in which it seems to occur, because I don't think it corresponds to anything that really happened. 
Um, and he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, it seems to me so similar to the, uh, to the behavior of the American mafia, the Italian mafia in New York in 1950. And he said, well, yes. He said, well, I think it might work. Have a go and see what happens. And, and it ran for to 29 years. Still running? <laughs> no, they just about, they've just taken it out of the repertoire now. Um, but um, I've done it once or twice. I will do it with things which people for, tend to forget when they talk about this, that almost everything in the opera world has been, I mean, even Shakespeare as well, is backdated. People complain about updating as if it was a sort of peculiarity of, you know, people like myself and certainly my younger colleagues. Um, they forget the fact that 90% of all the works written in the 19th century and the late 18th century are all backdated into a period about which the composer knew absolutely nothing whatever. They are just simply catering for what I've described as the audience who are sedentary tourists, who are looking at, oh, of course, it looks to me, how wonderful it is, I love that. Uh, we were there last year, it's exactly the same, uh, and, and they are relishing a sort of a, an exotic elsewhere, um, which, uh, about which they know nothing at all. And of course, Shakespeare um, would not have played the Roman plays in Roman dress, would he probably? No, probably not, um, or there may have been el allusions to it. Well, there's a clock, um, isn't there? In, yes. um, well, there are clocks, and there, yes, I mean, there are all sorts of things which are you know, obviously not references to what's going on. Um, but I think both Shakespeare and other playwrights, less and less as you go on in time, um, are backdated, and therefore you have to deal with them. And I don't. I will only. I will only update plays with one exception. I will only update plays if, in fact, uh, they are backdated. If they are, as in the case of, say, *The Marriage of Figaro* or uh, *Don Giovanni*, and and perhaps something like. Uh, Oh, I mean, there are a number of other operas like this, which, are, which, which the composer has set it in the period in which he was writing. La Traviata, for example. I've never felt tempted in the three productions I've done of that opera. I've never felt tempted to move it because uh, Verdi set it in his own time about which he knew a great deal, and I don't or at least I can acquaint myself with it. But also, it seems more natural to set it in the period in which he writes it. And on the whole, when I do update, I never update them, with one exception, I've never updated them into uh, last Thursday, which is what all my colleagues now do. They, when they update, they, they systematically update. And they are examples of what I call, it's a very interesting term which is used in New York, it's a Yiddish term for a, a profession. They're called schleppers, theatre schleppers. And what they mean by theatre schlepping is those are professions which take productions which have been successes on Broadway um, in, on tour and they put the sets into, a, a, uh, into these trucks and schlep them to the new destination. And I think that many of my colleagues who are systematic updaters are not directors, they're theatre schleppers. What they do is they dump the production in a truck, drive it 300 years up the freeway and drop it in last Thursday afternoon. That's not directing, that's theatre schlepping. And it, there has to be some sort of reason for the period into which you put it. There has to be what I've always described as um, theatrical or representational correspondence. I mean, between the mafia of uh, of uh, Italy, of, um, of of America, New York in the 1950s, and these these aristocratic world of the uh, of say of, of 1560, most of those aristocrats are nothing more than mafia thugs. And Is that the one are, example where you really? No, I've done other ones as well. I've done a production of. Uh, of Tosca, for example. Uh, now, I'd never believe, believe that Napoleonic Rome that it seems to be taking place in, but what it was, seems to me when I once was, I, mean, I did it uh, great, with great success in, in Florence, it seemed to me to be absolutely indistinguishable from a film which was made by uh, an Italian um, called Rossellini. He made a film called Roma Città Aperta, Rome Open City, and it was set amongst the um, the occupation of Rome by the Germans in 1943 and I said 
That's exactly what I'm going to do. So Scarpia becomes a Scarp chief of police. Well, uh, well he I, was anyway. I, I, I based it in, just before the, the Germans came in and based it on the Italian fascists. And Scarpia was just become a, a thing. And I, it, I just made it like that. And it somehow came to life in a very curious way. It was first objected to when they first heard about it by the uh, very conservative um, Italian opera going population. Uh, community um, who didn't like to see things done like that and I was standing in the wings waiting for the curtain to come down and waiting for the terrible booze which often accompany that sort of novelty and then the curtain went up and we took our bow there was uh, half the audience had come down to the front and were going yes 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 and I went off backstage up you know, to the uh, uh, exit uh, at the end after about half an hour and there were about 40 people waiting outside um, pushing pieces of paper into my top pocket with the names of fathers and brothers who had been killed by the fascists in, and they said thank you for remembering our dead. It worked and I've done it about two or three times um, but otherwise I wouldn't dream of doing it with Figaro, I wouldn't dream of doing it with... I mean when I've done the magic flute I've never updated the magic flute, I've done it with a new one coming up in, uh, tomorrow at the ENO. You know, I haven't the faintest idea what he's done with it but I think that what it's about is something which is conspicuously ignored with most productions because they think it's, it's very exotic and playful and uh, magical. There's nothing magical, there's nothing about a magic flute. What it's about is something which people don't pay any attention to at all. And whenever I've done it, I've set it in a, in a Masonic lodge or a Masonic library in the year it was written. And you have to remember that it was written about two years after the fall of the Bastille and about uh, uh, two and a half years before the onset of the Terror. And when Wordsworth said, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. And then people have always asked me when I've done the uh, Tosk, uh, when I've done Magic Flute, they said, um, how are you going to bring on uh, the Queen of the Night? And I said, well, uh, as long as she hasn't got any orthopedic problems, I, 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 I'm just going to walk on. They said, but she's the Queen of the Night. And I said, well, you, yes, but well, we know who she is. They said, what do you mean you know who she is? She's the Queen of the Night. I said, no, she's not. She's the Empress Maria Theresa a Catholic monarch whose Jesuit police raided her son, Joseph II's Masonic Lodge, because, in fact, she was against the idea of this sort of liberalism and the Enlightenment. The whole opera is about the, uh, the éclaircissement, the, the, the aufklärung, the, the Enlightenment. That's what the opera is about. That's the subject of the opera. And if you don't pay attention to that, you've got it all wrong. <laughs> I'm going to bring the audience in a moment, but Jonathan, you spoke movingly of those Italians coming forward with their slips of paper. Yeah. It, do you think that drama, opera, experience in the theatre changes people? Well, it can do. You can actually... Be, it changes people in the way that literature of any sort, or whether art of any sort, is that it redirects your attention to what, in fact, you had previously not noticed. And that is a pleasure, because it actually reacquaints you with aspects of what you thought you knew, finding, in fact, that your attention has been directed to something which, in fact, was there all the time, and that it, it reacquaints you with it. And, of course, as William James said in one of his most interesting essays on this subject, we all know what attention is but we have no idea what it is that actually consists of. But we know that it consists of something which is very odd, in that what in fact is in front of our eyes at any given particular moment is not what we see. What we see is what our attention is directed towards. And we may, at one moment, when someone like an artist or a writer has actually reacquainted you with an aspect of what is to be seen. Wittgenstein talks about this a great deal. I mean, these philosophers had a great influence on me. He but redirects your attention to what was there all the time and you hadn't previously noticed. Does it make you nicer people? No, it just makes you more attentive and interested in what it's like to be alive. That's the function of the art. The function of art is to reacquaint you with what your life is like and because, in fact, in most of our lives we spend our time doing things and attending really to what is relevant to what we have to do next, and what the arts do is it allows you there to be a pause, a hesitation, in the course of which your attention is directed to aspects which previously had not been noticed. 
and that's what makes life more interesting. That's what it's about. It's simply making you realize how complicated uh, the experience of vision and of sound really is. Pretty good. Ladies and gentlemen, o over to you. I've got more questions if you haven't got any. It's always a sign. It's our hand, yeah. yeah. Could you stand up so we can all hear you? That would be embarrassing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember in the 60s, I think, seeing the production of... Um, Romeo and Juliet. No, was it? No, it was the Merchant of Venice somewhere in London, which you had oh, that set was in Edwardian. Oh, I, no, I set it in 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 uh, 1890. In, 1890. Uh, yes, based on a, on a, on an Italian photographer of that period. Well, it was hugely enjoyable, but I left feeling this isn't the way we did it at school. No. <laughs> and secondly, what did it gain from that? But that wasn't my question. My question was <laughs> broader. Um, I'd love to know what you think about w what is art, I mean visual arts, because uh, what is art and what isn't art? Do you have any views? Well, I mean, as, as the word implies, art is, is, is it's, it's no accident that it belongs to the same word as artificial. It's something other than what it actually is. But it, in question of art, it's painting, um, which is not actually what it's of. It's uh, there's some degree of art or artificiality in the look at a picture. It's not a view through a glass at something which is beyond. It's artificial. So that that's what art is. Art is in fact doing something um, to some extent which is other than what it's what what it seems to be, but nevertheless draws your attention to aspects of what there is to be seen which you hadn't previously noticed. But when you talk about um, whether it, that particular um, Merchant of Venice corresponded to anything, well, this is a very interesting question. Nothing that is revived, I mean, I have a, there's a vast, complicated literature to which I'm addressing myself at the moment, trying to write about it. The idea of reproduction, which is what we do when we give birth to um, children and the children themselves reproduce and they give birth to things um, is determined by something we call uh, the genotype. It actually determines what in fact something is going to be an instance of. Well, uh, that actually has some sort of relationship to the act of reproduction of stuff which in fact is redone many years after it was first made by the author. And what happens over the course of time is that works which were written for, to be seen by and experienced by an audience at a particular period when it was written, sometimes outlive the, uh, the author or the composer or the artist. Um, beyond his wildest dreams of posterity, which means that it is being seen, being heard, being looked at, watched by audiences who have seen things which could never have been anticipated by the person who wrote it. And that actually, <clears throat> although there are moments in which you violate it to the point of it being idiotic what you do, Nevertheless, unless you take account of the fact that the work is being reproduced sometimes 300 years after it was written, composed, or made, um, there is a sense in which it, it will irresistibly and necessarily undergo a change which does not correspond to what the author himself uh, thought of when he was writing it. And that happens, I think, in that particular period. I, I, one of the reasons why I did it was that um, I had to persuade Laurence Olivier not to do a standard version of what he thought Jews looked like. And I had to explain to him, actually, Larry, I'm Jewish myself, and I don't look anything like you're looking now, um, <laughs> <laughs> with your rock lips, and, uh, and he got himself a very elaborate yes. nose and all that sort of thing. And I said, oh, really, do you must stop doing that. <laughs> and, uh, he kept the teeth. Oh, he kept the teeth because I couldn't bear to, to say you must. He got himself very elaborate false teeth. I, I've never seen Jewish teeth. Um, I, <laughs> but, I, but I didn't have. But because he, he kept his mouth fairly close, I didn't, I didn't feel, oh, those Jewish teeth again. Um, but I said, I want you to be um, just someone who in 1890. 
uh, is someone who uh, was suffering, as indeed most of the victims of fascism at that period, or just shortly afterwards did. I just want you to be a, a Jewish businessman working in Venice in 1890. And I want you to be someone who is not quite clearly recognized, but nevertheless is in fact the victim of prejudice against someone who happens to be Jewish, whatever that means. And, uh, and gradually, I mean, bit by bit, in return for the bits of business I gave him, interesting things to do, off came the nose for a while, and then off came the ringlets and things, and then eventually, apart from the false teeth, which I, you know, I felt, oh, well, I mean, you better keep those, Larry. Um, <laughs> And anyway, you, you, you've got to eat now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it, it just was what I want. But with, with, with the passage of time, all artwork changes. It changes its appearance because we see things in it which is not. Now, there are two forms of art which uh, Nelson Goodman, this wonderful writer on the um, pictorial art, says that there are two forms of art. There are what he calls allographic and autographic arts. Autographic arts are things like sculptures and paintings, uh, which in fact you make them at one time, and as long as they don't decay, they exist perhaps, you know, uh, 300, 1,000 years later. Allographic works are works which in fact involve an instruction with regard to a product, to a, uh, an artwork. In other words, they're scripts, or they are scores, and therefore, there can be a long period in which nothing happens at all, and there is no artifact there until they get done again. When our autographic works themselves undergo changes, sculptures undergo changes, which could not have been foreseen. The one I cite constantly is this wonderful thing. Well, you will see many of them, but if you go to the Vatican Museum, you will see a famous um, sculpture called the Belvedere Torso. It has no head. No arms, no legs. It's been very, very badly damaged. But it takes pride of place in the, uh, in the gallery there. There it is, with chopped off from there, chopped off from the, the, from the knees, and no head. Now, I'm sure that where the uh, sculptor who made it, the, aut the autographic work which he made, see that it was exhibited, and say, what in God's name are you doing exhibiting this badly damaged version of what I have just done? But on the other hand, if we subsequently were to, uh, were to rediscover the arms, and in fact there were episodes in which they put back arms in the previous uh, two or three hundred years, and uh, we would feel it was an act of uh, vandalism to put the, the arms back on. Something has happened to the work, something has happened to the work in this way that we actually see in it Precisely because it hasn't got anything other than a torso, we see aspects of torsos which we previously had overlooked. And that's what's happening all the time. There is no such thing as an authentic production. There's no such thing as an authentic work of art. They all undergo massive changes as a result of purely mechanical uh, distortions or getting old or being uh, you know, stained or in the case of pictures, but also in performance where you have something which is merely a script, what you think the script is of, what you think the score is of, will undergo changes with the passage of time. I admit that there can be moments in which you say this is a violation because it just bears no relationship to what in fact is in the score. But nevertheless, if you look back at the way in which people performed Shakespeare, say Laurence Olivier, in the 1950s, People all talked like that. To be or not to be, that is the question. And it's bullshit. It's, it's, you don't hear anyone thinking. What you are hearing is someone verse speaking. And what only thing that interests me is what is someone trying to do or persuade you about when they are uttering something. But if they're doing that very Shakespearean way of talking, which fortunately is vanishing from the, uh, from the performance world, you underestimate the extent to which the passage of time and the transformation of the audiences who have seen things look, no one look, we now hear that Indians are now sending things to Mars um, now no one at the time of the British Empire in India would have ever acquainted themselves with any Indian who had actually any interest in Mars whatsoever <laughs> so Things have 
change with the passage of time. We, the modern audience is acquainted with a world which the world for whom it was written, and we are unacquainted. Uh, it's almost time, folks, but it's, it's, we mustn't stop, must we, quite yet. Another five minutes? Yeah, anyone that wishing to leave, leave now. <laughs> um, can I just, sorry, I'm, I'm going to let you write in, but one quick response to that. Yes. Because, um, you're saying everything changes and praising it, but you don't, in some ways, like change, do you? You think the world's going to the dog. Oh, no, no, I, I mean, I, I, there are all sorts of changes which I approve of. We've, mm. we've become more humanitarian, more more interested in each other's things and more interested in the disorders, psychological and psychiatric disorders and so forth. But there are things which, in fact, we've become more and more um, exponents of, which is uh, our monstrous uh, atrocities. Um, of course, it's something that we've always been capable of. That's why I, ethnicity does not interest me in the least. When people say, well, to my Jewish relatives will often say, why don't you honour your ancestors? Well, I say I'm also chimpanzee-ish, <laughs> but, but, but I don't have any particular interest in chimpanzees, whom who we've also treated rather badly in the past. Um, I, I, we're all the same. If we can produce fertile offspring, we are simply... Uh, homo sapiens, though now I know not sapiens enough. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Another, we've got time for one more question, ladies and gentlemen, if you're bursting. Yes, sir. Um, man, um, just thank you for the position of your thoughts um, and uh, the sharp clarity of the government expressed. Um, I noticed um, a year or two ago when I was reading a book um, on desert island discs and those who have appeared in it, uh, that you, you obviously made two appearances yourself. Yes, I did, yes. What I found interesting was the, the way your musical t tastes had changed, yes. and not, not surprisingly, over the 30-odd years uh, between the two. But the other thing that fascinated me was, given what I've referred to as your, your sharpness and clarity of speech, thought, uh, and, and writing, the fact that in the earlier one, your chosen... Um, Thing, the object you were going to take. Do you remember what it was? And, well, the, was uh, no, was I can't remember. No, it, it, it was a razor. Oh, to cut my throat. <laughs> 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 That's right. Yeah, it's more simple because I, I also thought that, look, I'm absolutely hopeless looking after myself in isolation on a desert island. Um, and I think that if, if, I, if I know that I'm there forever, um, much better to die. Um, yes. But the second, um, yeah, yes. 30 odd years later, <laughs> yes. was a case of dissecting uh, tools. Yes. Which obviously would have had sharp implements in them as well. Yes, right? and, and those yeah. were directed at, 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 cre at, cre at, cre at creatures um, who I was prepared to dissect. Um, not because they had asked me, oh, please get rid of me, um, <laughs> uh, but because I suppose even at the time when I, in fact, uh, uh, suggested the razor. Um, it coincided that time when I was st still and always have been deeply interested in the biology of reproduction or what it is to undergo this peculiar capacity to reproduce ourselves in ways which are in fact uh, versions of our predecessors. Ladies and gentlemen, just before you give, and I'm sure you will, Jonathan, a great round of applause, can, oh. you, can you tell the Marie Antoinette joke? Yeah. Which one? This is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a moment. This is about Fifi, you know, about the afterlife when she's on her way to the guillotine. Oh. Can you remember it? <laughs> oh, yes. And, uh, who, who's the. She's talking to her name and she says, Who's the one? She said, I don't know where that's a day. Yeah, that's right. Yes, uh, that's right. Yes, uh, and I had this idea about. You, you see her with her hands behind her back on, the way, to, on okay. the way to the guillotine. And uh, I said to the, uh, someone, she's comforting her sister, saying, no, it is all right. I have this thought that I am going to be Doris Day, whoever that is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was Doris Day, but I was someone else. Somebody else. Shirley Temple. Sure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jonathan Miller, thank you very much.